are struggling, those who are in the hospital, those who have recently lost loved ones. Life is just so fragile, and there's so much about life that's just uncertain and unknown. We may encounter various storms at different times in our lives, but we know that your Son calms the storms. We're at peace because we know Him and we know you. Bless us this evening. Continue to love us and care for us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to, uh, the way we set up this class is the panel has study questions, so it's really not, we really don't, we're not set up to answer questions. Um, so we're going to try and just uh, keep it up here. You can find any one of us after. I was going to say, and some of you have heard this, but I told my wife 33 years ago when we married that if she ever left me, I was going with her. <laughs> Those of you that know me can understand. So we're going to be talking about a pretty deep subject tonight. Uh, when I was researching um, more pornography than adultery, um, I don't know that I've ever necessarily thought of it in this way, but it's an addictive compulsive disorder, just like other things, except that the thing that has changed is just ask a school age parent how it's different today than it was when we were kids. We didn't have phones and computers and everything and there weren't things being passed around and videos being sent to eight year olds that no one has any business watching. So a few statistics, Craig put them up on the uh, PowerPoint. So 30 to 40% of married couples will cheat at least once. But 90% of Americans think that it is immoral to cheat. Those two don't really seem to go together for me. 60% of affairs start with close friends or coworkers. 69% of all divorces are because of infidelity. I don't know if I have a guilty pleasure in life. I love watching Judge Judy. I'll just admit it. <laughs> and Judge Judy, about half of her cases are about uh, affairs and all. And she very quickly says that 50% of the marriages in America today fail. And if that's right, that is really, really sad. 4.2 million pornographic websites, that's 12% of all websites. 72 million visitors each year to pornographic sites. And 40 million American people visit porn sites. Craig was telling me today, we're not going to have time to talk about everything, but he was talking about uh, spending in America. And uh, it was better one year because... Uh, people thought they were getting free pornographic sites. Now, free, por free porn sites aren't really free. They're just free the first time you visit, and then they get you caught up. Uh, one reason that porn is such a big problem, when I was a kid, I remember going into 7-Elevens, and my dad didn't like us going into 7-Elevens, and you'd see the magazine that had a brown paper bag-looking thing on it, and it was you know, kind of up high where kids couldn't mess with it. Now, it takes a kid 15 seconds to pull up a pornographic site. So a verse I wanted to share, if I did, won't steal from others, 1 Peter 5 eight could be for any sin, but especially for pornography. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. So, Daryl, Share with us any verses or passages in the Old Testament that are focused on either adultery or pornography. Okay. I first just want to start off with explaining how we get assigned these topics. <laughs> <laughs> we get, uh, we're asked, hey, do you want to teach? And we say, yeah, sure. Or, or and, we don't. And then we have, uh, yeah, or you get voluntold. You voluntold. Yeah. <laughs> 
So then we have this email that comes out from Carrie with all the schedule and all the topics. And so we got a little uh, slide here to demonstrate our reaction. <laughs> is, that's not the way we reacted to it, okay? But anyway, um, we needed some levity with this, with this deep, uh, <laughs> deep uh, subject. But it needs to be talked about. I mean, just because we're Christians, we're in the church, doesn't mean we're not at risk. And so I'm going to start with the Old Testament. And, you know, if you read through the Old Testament a few times, you'll see this uh, progression. Um, you see the definition of sin, and then you will see uh, the consequences of sin. And then later on, you'll see the sin in action. And I'm going to kind of draw these out for you. And then, you, uh, and then kind of moving through the, the uh, scriptures, you'll see reflections on the foolishness of this sin. So the definition of sin, we'll go to the uh, Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, 14. You shall not commit adultery. Okay, that's pretty straightforward and simple. It doesn't leave any question. And Exodus 20, 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or female servant or his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So Webster's uh, dictionary defines covet as to feel an inordinate desire for what belongs to another. So people engaging in adultery and or pornography, they are coveting. They desire that which belongs to another. So, with the, okay, there's the, the definition of the sin. Let's go to the consequences. Exodus defines the sin in the Ten Commandments. These next verses in Leviticus and Deuteronomy define the consequences. Leviticus 18.20. You shall not have intercourse with your neighbor's wife to be defiled with her. Leviticus 20.10. If there is a man who commits adultery with another man's wife, one who commits adultery with his friend's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man is found lying with a married woman, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. Thus you shall purge the evil from Israel. Okay, so God took this pretty seriously. I mean, even to the point of a, a death penalty. Uh, so that's kind of the lessons we can learn there. Now let's look at the sin in action. All right, so probably know where I'm going with this. Uh, probably the most famous story of adultery, but David and Bathsheba. So 2 Samuel 11, 2. Now when, evening had come, now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. And when she had purified herself from her uncleanness, she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. So I'm, now I'm sure David understood adultery and coveting were, were, were sins. I'm sure he understood the consequences of of that sin. Because he, he obviously goes to great lengths to hide the sin. I mean, committing another sin, murder. Uh, one can argue that David's involvement in pornography, that is watching the bathing Bathsheba, led to adultery. Okay, so we see the sin in action. And then uh, Proverbs gives us some reflections on the foolishness of this sin. And I'm going to draw from Proverbs 6 here. Uh, Proverbs 6, starting in verse 16. There are six things which the Lord hates, yes, seven of which are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes and a lying tongue, a hand, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises, devises wicked plans, feet that run rapidly to evil, a false witness who utters lies, and one who spreads strife among brothers. Okay, so so far the proverb writer tells us what the Lord hates. The writer starts by giving, uh, I call it a don't do list, okay? And he follows that up, next, he follows up the don't do list with a to do list. Uh, let's, let's continue on verse 20. My son, observe the commandment of your father and do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart, tie them around your neck. 
When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching is light, and the reproofs for discipline are the way of life. So now the writer here is kind of repeating what Moses wrote about in Deuteronomy 6. So we see a don't-do list, we see a to-do list, and next the, the proverb writer, uh, he, he draws out the why, okay? So why would one not want to faithfully follow uh, verses 20 through 23? Well, let's keep reading in verse 24. To keep you from the evil woman, from the smooth tongue of the adulteress, do not desire her beauty in your heart, nor let her capture you with her eyelids. For on account of a harlot, one is reduced to a loaf of bread, and adulteress hunts for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? Or can a man walk on hot coals, and his feet not be scorched? So is the one who goes into his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her will not go unpunished. And then later on in verse 32, the one who commits adultery with a woman is lacking sense. He would destroy himself. Uh, he who would destroy himself does it. So pornography and adultery is playing with fire. In verse 27, can a man take fire in his bosom and can his clothes not be burned? I, I think that explains it pretty well. You, you'll, you will get burned playing with fire. In verses 29 and 32 have the consequences. You know, whoever touches her will not go unpunished or he would destroy himself. So those are some of the verses from the Old Testament I'd like to draw out there and, and try to piece those together as we talk about uh, adultery and pornography. Dalen, uh, how about key passages in the four Gospels? Yes. Um, we're going to be in Matthew 5, 27 through 37. And my question was to define adultery and pornography in the four Gospels. So we've actually gone over this verse 28 in Matthew 5 with self-control. We've gone over it with addiction. We've gone over it quite a few times in this class. It's been brought up. But let's read it again. You have heard it said, this is Jesus talking, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery within, with her in his heart. And then he goes on to say, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right arm causes you to sin, cut it off. It's better for you to lose body parts and go to heaven than it is to lose your entire body and soul to hell. So the next verse, verse 31, goes into divorce, tying it in together. It says, in 31, it, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, if we take the divorce functionality that we all know and understand of adultery, and then we take, in this version, I believe I did English Standard Version for sexual immorality in verse 32. Um, I did a word search, which is the word pornaya, which is where we get the word for pornography, and Craig will cover that. But I learned that the English Standard Version, the NIV, the New King James, and the New American Standard Version all say sexual immorality there. But the older versions, King James, American Standard Version, and New American Standard Version 95, they use the word fornication or unchastity. So if we were to take the sexual intercourse act and say unchastity meaning before marriage or without marriage, and then we take the fornication part, which would be if you're married and stepping out of the marriage, then Jesus is saying you can be divorced. Anytime you're divorced, adultery is involved. And so adultery being your breaking of a commitment to that person, breaking of that oath to the one that you have an oath with. And it's followed by verse 33 where he's talking about don't give oaths, don't swear falsely. You can't change the color of your hair, white or black. So don't, don't swear. Let your yes be yes, let your no be no. And so if we take that idea of adultery being a commitment, when we read verse 28, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So you've already broken the promise you made to your spouse if you're looking at pornography. You've already taken that sin into your heart and you've already, and if we continue down the path as we know of following into that sin, then eventually we can act on that sin. And that would be fornication. So you can get divorced without fornication, but if you get divorced, period, adultery is there because you can no longer keep your commitment, and she or he can no longer keep their commitment. 
And that's what he says in verse 32. But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife, except for the grounds of sexual immorality or fornication, makes her commit adultery because she can no longer keep her commitment to you, to the person. And whoever marries a divorced woman keeps her from keeping that commitment back to them. Greg Acts, Acts through Revelation. A um, couple of quick verses highlight the, the difference, the definition with adultery and pornography. Uh, Hebrews 13.4 is the first one. Let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral. That is the Greek word pornos and the adulterous, which is the word moikosis. Uh, Dalen pointed out and Daryl to some extent, there is a difference between the two and I'll, I'll cover that a little bit more here in just a second. Uh, but we know the sexual relationship has been reserved for marriage and then that marriage bed becomes sacred as part of that vow that you've taken with your spouse and with God. And the sexual immorality is to stay out of it. A uh, greater warning about that here in just a second. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral... That's pornos, again, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, moikos, nor men who practice homosexuality, and so on. Now there again, we have a distinction between the two, the two acts. Uh, I'd like to add just real quick what both land, uh, Landon, sorry. Wow. Is that, is that an insult to you or your brother? <laughs> Probably me. Okay. What Dalen and Daryl mentioned, but specifically with David and his progression from letting his eyes view something that he wanted and lusted after, and he did not put up a barrier. He didn't stop, and therefore it carried on, and then sin was born. And this is from James chapter 1, verse 15. When lust has conceived, which happens all the time, we'll just admit it right now, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished or is fully formed, brings forth death the warning is pretty great already we we have to we have to put up barriers right now against all of this and right away acts chapter 15 verses 20 and 29 and chapter 21 verse 25 and, and they pretty much say the same things uh, in regarding the gentiles this is verse 19 of Acts chapter 15. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who have turned to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by, by idols and from sexual immorality. They're told three times pretty quickly in Scripture there as they're coming into the church get rid of the sexual immorality. And we know from the letter to the Corinthians that this is a large part of their culture this is what they had and three quick warnings get this out of your life coming into the church and we'll talk more about that here in a few minutes as well Dalen alluded to uh, the word is uh, is often translated fornication but it's really just too narrow a term for pornia this is engaging in not not merely seeing but engaging in the act of pornia. Uh, as he mentioned, it's not grounds for divorce, not by Jesus' definition. Lust is where it begins, and lust unchecked becomes a sin that, that turns to death. Uh, but that's not the definition of pornia. It is the, the physical act. It's getting into and engaging in illicit sexual intercourse, which... The definition includes all these you see here. Adultery, fornications included, homosexuality, lesbianism, intercourse with animals, etc. All the things that you don't want to think about. Daryl brought this up a few moments ago. Sexual intercourses uh, with close relatives in Leviticus chapter 18. Or sexual intercourse with a divorced man or woman. And that's in Mark chapter 10 verses 11 and 12. Lust is not included in this definition. You don't see this, it's, it's part of it, but it is part of the introduction to, and again, if we, 
uh, allow these things to come into our bodies through our eyes or ears or however we choose to do that and then don't put up a block and don't get rid of it. It will lead to pornia. Now, tonight's discussion, specifically pornography, is why I have this up here, is pornia and pornography. The word that we use and have grown accustomed to is derived from the Greek word pornographos. And this is a compound word of uh, pornos or porne, which means harlot or prostitute, one who gives themselves to this activity, and graphene meaning to write. So technically, pornography, writing about prostitutes. However... The Greek word graphene not only means to write, but also includes drawings and paintings. Therefore, pornography as we know it, or as we talk about it today, modern times, pertains to the depiction of erotic behavior through writings, pictures, and movies, and is intended to cause sexual excitement or lust. And that's where it begins. We will... Um I, I want to differentiate. Is there a possibility that someone goes to a website that's pornographic accidentally? It happens. Uh, I have a horrible story. A friend of mine at Christmas time was trying to show his family dogs that they might be interested in buying. So he pulled up White House, meant to pull up whitehouse.org. He pulled up whitehouse.com, and you don't want to go there. Especially with your family, grandmother, aunts, <laughs> everybody else sitting around. Um, years ago, I was talking to Mac Lyon with Search, and I, I said to Mac that I was looking forward to being his age, and I think at the time he was 85, um, because I wouldn't have to worry about where my eyes are going bad anymore. And he said, Terry, it doesn't quite work that way because even at an older age, your eyes can still and mine can go places you don't want it to. One, one more quick story. I had a young friend uh, years ago that I, I love this story. He had been invited by his girlfriend and her family to go to Whitewater Bay, and um, he didn't go. I ran into him that day, and I said, why didn't you go? And he just very plainly said, Carrie, if I go there, my eyes will make my mind and heart wonder where it shouldn't be. And he was probably a sophomore in high school. He was 12. He was 12. I guess I just gave it away who it was. So um, <laughs> I, I never have forgotten what Jack uh, said that time. It's the truth because if our minds and one of the problems we have in the world is it's so easy and accepted uh, to go maybe where we shouldn't go so I told the guys we would combine their second set of questions with their last set of questions so Daryl and you can also talk about uh, how we differ from the view but your question is Daryl should we as a congregation be talking more about these sins of the flesh Outside of taking out our own eyeballs, what ways can we fight to keep our eyes, mind, and heart pure? Okay, so Carrie, we're skipping the second. One. We are. Okay. You can roll it into the last. Okay, all right. Uh, should we be talking about these sins? Yes. Um, this is a problem, and we are kidding ourselves if we think that this is this problem is not in the church. Uh, we need to train our minds. If you're struggling with, with this, you, you need a way to take your mind away from this evil. Uh, uh, similar to a dog collar on a dog, when you're trying to train the dog to not run out of the yard, uh, you, you need something to remind you to keep Jesus in your thoughts and Satan out of your thoughts. And so if you're caught up in this sin, you need to, you need to be renewing your mind. This is repeat for people who were here last night, but Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is and that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Another verse I want to refer to is Colossians 3, 1. Therefore, you have been raised up with Christ. Keep seeking the things above where Christ is, 
seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of Jesus, and all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. I think this verse 17, if you're struggling with this, put this one in your memory banks, okay? It's a great reminder. You, you cannot do pornography or adultery in the name of the Lord. If that, if that is happening, you have separated yourself from God. So re renew your mind. Set your mind on things above, not on things around this earth. And remember, you, you are dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and greed. So Dale, in your $20 million question is, with the accessibility of the internet, <laughs> what ways can we build a barrier for ourselves to keep us standing <laughs> strong against pornographic material? <clears throat> I think us here at the panel, we all agree that uh, to, to, and I'm sure you all agree also that to say, what does the Bible say about adultery and pornography? It's easy to say, it says it's wrong. Lust of the eyes is very simple. It talks about it, very laid out, not a whole lot. But what we agreed on was, what do we do about it? How do we stop it? How do we put guides in place to stop this? Or how do we have things? I know Craig mentioned accountability partners. Um, Craig, I've, I've offered, if you guys want or not, um, for the parents to, of kids in the youth group. If, you ha if your son or daughter has an iPhone, how do you lock it down? There are ways to do screen time. Uh, make sure that the phones are in your bedroom charging at night. Make sure that they don't have them after it. everything shuts down at 8 o'clock. You can have everything shut down at 4 o'clock or where they can only call you. But there's ways to close them down. I've talked with Ken. He understands um, how to do uh, uh, Android phones. I don't know how to do Android phones, but iPhones are very easy to lock down. As far as computers go, that's a, a whole other subject. Um, for every six ways to lock something down, there's 10 ways to unlock it. So computers in kids' bedrooms shouldn't happen. Or have a way, I've talked to Brian Mangus about this, have a way to shut off the internet at a certain time, uh, whether it's at the switch in your bedroom or some way to be able to kill that Wi-Fi code or whatever are some of the only ways. Um, I do know that some of the locks in the iPhone do shut down and block things. We have already been through that with uh, one of ours, and it worked. It worked very well, actually. So there are ways. Are you going to talk about Covenant Eyes? Uh, eventually, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, yeah. Let, I'll let you go into that. But there are ways to, to block it. But most of all, I think we should, we should have a class on how to, to talk with adults and spouses about how to talk to each other about it, and then we should also how to talk with parents of how to handle it with their kids. So one of Tim's comments that I never will forget is he was talking about marital couples, and marital couples should not have passwords on their computers that their mate doesn't know, because there shouldn't be a time that you wouldn't be willing to share whatever you're looking at with your mate. So just a comment. So I was trying to leave some extra time for Craig because he's got lots of information. <laughs> so Craig. Yeah, 15 minutes, Craig. Yeah. Craig, it's not just the internet, it's in our culture. TV, movies, plays, and music all contain sights and sounds that distract us from living holy lives. How do we teach our children how important it is to separate ourselves from the sin of the world? In 15 minutes. Okay. The other part of my uh, assignment tonight was how the world might view this differently than Christians in New Testament example. And we're again in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It's really an amazing scripture, but Dalen's right on the money. And let me just say, before I really get going here, We've got to start talking about it. Some really ugly statistics will say that 
practically everybody in this room tonight has struggled with it, is dealing with it on some level, has seen it, whether intentionally or uh, by accident, like Carrie was mentioning about Mac. If you're having struggle with it, find somebody to talk to. I'll have a couple of websites you can do that. I'll just admit, I've got a history. I, I have stories to tell. They're too, they're not for this room, but if you're interested, we can talk about it later. And if you have a problem, I'm available. Dalen's available. Any of the elders are available. But if you think you can just kind of put this on the back burner and hold it back there and it'll eventually go away, you're fooling yourself and something really bad's going to happen eventually. For instance, in the Corinthian church, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and we know what was going on there. We know what the culture was like, but it says it was actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. still see the definition here on the screen of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. That's the world that we're talking about. What does the world think about it? A man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from you. And then you go further down the chapter, verses 9 through 11. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Remember the warnings in, in, uh, in Acts three times to the Greeks who have come into the church. Get this out of your life. Stay away from sexually immoral things. He goes on to say, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy swindlers and so on, because to get away from them, you're going to have to get out of the world. Now, we're required to be in and amongst the world. How else are we going to bring the light to them and bring them to the Lord? But he's talking about in the church, I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother who is guilty of sexual immorality or greed and so on, not to even eat with such a one. This is a group in the church. This is an, another case of where it begins as a, an idea or a thought, and they don't put up barriers and protect against it, and it has come into the church, and they're proud of themselves for their compassion and empathy that they're showing with this man who is fully engaged in sexual immorality. Get out of it. Well, you want a picture of what the world thinks uh, versus how we should act and, and where the church is. And they had gone so far as to do things that they wouldn't even do. Just imagine that for a moment, how bad that is. Don't associate with these sexually immoral people. So by way of the church here in this description, you get a pretty good sense of the world's thinking on Pornia. Um Unfortunately, the church here has allowed it to seep in the, to the point that they've embraced it. And we can put that on, a, on an individual level. Think of it that way. If you don't put this away, get rid of it, put up barriers to it, it can take over your life as well. Temple prostitutes, orgies, etc. This is a part of the culture there. This is the pornia that's going on in the culture all around them. Keep it out of the church. The world today is not much different. I looked through some discussions on Reddit and some other places and was going to get some... Uh, conversations most of it is just not fit for this gathering most people are of the opinion that a little bit's okay and whatever it's that's fine it doesn't really matter it does matter and I'll, I'll show you why here in just a second um, how do we teach our children the importance of separating ourselves from the, the sin of the world well Pornography in the culture. It, it is, it's absolutely everywhere. Carrie stole my, t t uh, stole my story about Mac, but I love that. The, the man was just absolutely appalled that whatever mistake he made and some image came up on his computer and he didn't trust it anymore. He didn't want to use it. Anything that required internet uh, research, he wanted somebody else to do for him. But uh, just that image of him absolutely putting it away, and a man that I believe in my heart um, just would not have ever sought that out, and still, it was so readily available, it, it popped up. And here's the thing about seeing those things. 
Once you've seen an image like that, you can't unsee it. I can remember things that I've seen over 30 years ago, and not by choice, but they're still there. The other story I have, and this happened yesterday. Talk about providence, I guess. I, I, I don't know. You can judge. A friend of mine, I was talking with a friend of mine, her daughter at, at school, and there was another girl there who, for some reason, has Snapchat on her phone, and she was showing some pictures around to the other kids. And her daughter said it was private parts, personal private parts. And she knows, because they've talked about it, this is not something that we do review. So she didn't look at it, but she did tell the teacher. So the teacher investigated and found out that there was a 19-year-old that was sending explicit pictures to a 10-year-old girl. She said, I expected to have to deal with this probably in middle school, maybe high school, something like that. She's in the fourth grade. And this girl's got a phone, and she's showing, I'm not going to tell you what it was because it is not, it's not clean enough for this room, but it's absolutely horrible. I was absolutely appalled. It's just horrible, and it's just, it's everywhere. Um, I was going to bring with me, and I forgot, I ran out of the office and just forgot. This is a quote from Damon Brown, the <clears throat> author of Porn and Pong and Playboy's Greatest Covers. But I have no idea what that is. I just know it's a quote from it. It says, it seems so obvious. If we invent a machine, the first thing we're going to do after making a profit is use it to watch porn. When the projector was invented uh, a century ago, the first movies were not of damsels in distress, but stilted porn shots called stag films. And this is from many, many years ago. I, I was going to bring from the office a VHS cassette, which I think everybody knows, and a, a beta cassette. And the beta ones are a little smaller. Those are the ones you saw in school. Remember the teacher would roll the AV card out there and you had that big machine and clunk. And that was the professional one because Sony would not allow the porn industry to use their media to make videos with. That's why we all know what VHS cassettes are and had one in our home because the porn industry took it over and it's just so widespread. A few years later, I suppose most of you are familiar with Blu-ray. The reason we have Blu-ray at home and not HD DVD is because Sony, having previously missed out on all the money they could have made, <laughs> allowed them to use that for the porn industry. And all through history from the beginning, Wherever the porn industry lands on what kind of media we have, that's, that's what you're going to end up with in your home. That's what's most widely known. It's just so prevalent. Um, he says VHS became the dominant standard for VCRs largely because Sony wouldn't allow them to use beta. Movie industry followed. DVDs, internet, cell phones, you name it. Pornography planted its big flag there first, or at least shortly thereafter. Well... This is what it's like in our culture. <laughs> Carrie mentioned this a little while ago. I think it was 2016. The revenue in the United States was $13 billion, the porn. The following year, it was down to 10. Because somebody figured out if you make it free, you'll get people to come in, and then you can charge them later. Use it as bait. But free websites right now are about 70 to 80% of all adult material online. And that's how they get you and get that. If they can just get in the window, uh, then they can grab a hold of you. There was an analysis of about 400 million web searches. And the most popular, this should scare you, the most popular category of sexual search was for youth. Did I just mention a 19-year-old sent explicit pictures to a 10-year-old girl? It's an analysis of over a million hits on Google's mobile search sites. That's this. How many of us have one of these and our children? Porn was the most popular at more than 20%, more than one in five searches, five minutes. 2017 online interviews with teens aged between 13 and 17 and parents, 71% of teens have done something to hide what they were doing online. That's clearing their browser history, closing the window quickly, whatever they needed to do. 32% of teens admit to intentionally accessing nude or pornographic content. 
on a regular basis. 43% weekly, and only 12% of parents knew about this. 2017 study found that 99% of respondents somewhat approved of explicit pictures being posted online non-consensually, particularly if your loved one had walked out on them. As Dr. Brooks describes a pervasive order, there were five of these, I just chose two because they were, uh, well, the two I felt most passionate about, I guess, linked to the consumption of soft core pornography. This is just your playboy type stuff, beginner level, we'll call it. Voyeurism, they lose the ability or the desire to uh, communicate with people on a one-to-one -one basis. It's an obsession with looking at women rather than in engaging with them or interacting with them uh, personally and objectification, and this is what happens. It's like a drug. Once you let it in and it, it goes unchecked, it physically changes the way you think. God made, there's this beautiful language in Genesis where he declares that God's not good by himself and he takes a rib from Adam's side and makes a companion to go with him, this beautiful creation. And over time, if you allow this to run unchecked, that creation that God made becomes a collection of parts. Some thoughts about all the, uh, the there, this was, how big was this article you remember? It was 34, 43 pages, 43 pages from this Covenant Eyes. Uh, I can give you a copy, it's free to download. Uh, just statistics after statistics. I could go on forever, but just some of the comments that were made from all the data that's come through over the years. This material, the pornography that we have in our culture today, that's mm -hmm. easily accessible and available to you and your children, it's more aggressive, more harmful, more violent, degrading and damaging than any other time in the history of the world in this generation, dealing with it to an intensity and scale no other generation in the history of the world. This is the Department of Justice and I remember at night when you had the family shows and then they did the raunchy stuff after the kids went to bed. But now, never before in the history of telecommunications media has so much indecent and obscene material been so easily accept accessible by so many minors in American homes with so few restrictions. Modern science allows us to understand the underlying nature of an addiction to pornography is chemically nearly identical to a heroin addiction. It changes your brain. This is no joke. If you're dealing with it, or have dealt with it, or have trouble with it, talk to somebody so you can get rid of it. It changes your brain and the way you think. Um, one last one. Uh, Dale had mentioned some good things about getting the conversation started and how to prevent this. A coworker this, this afternoon said, you, if you're right there with your children all the time and right on top of them, you can probably prevent it, but what you're inevitably going to do is teach them how to circumvent the system and find ways to hide things and do it some other way. So how far do you back off? This is, I think, a good start. A warm and communicative parent-child relationship is the most important factor. In addition, open parent-child channels for communicating about sexual things and, and media experience, sex education at home and school, and parent petition, participation with your children. Get involved with your children. Whether you're homeschooling, you're already doing that, right, to some degree, but if they're in public school, know what's going on. Be involved in their lives. Be somebody that they can talk to about anything, and that's one way you're going to keep these doorways open if they trust in you enough to talk to you about these things, it's a way to start preventing these. Ever and last, this when I am weak dot org, my son Jack and one of his classmates from Bear Valley, Chris Croats, started this. It is a place where you can go if if you uh, want to start the conversation, but you don't know how or don't have somebody you trust to do that. You can go here. There's some great resources there and get started. And then this Covenant Eyes, uh, we got most of my statistics from tonight and some of the other information I shared with these fellows. Uh, don't let it slide.
And if it comes into your life, immediately start putting up some barriers. If you don't, it will take over. Thank, thank you to the panel for uh, everything. I think Galen has a great idea. We need to come up with some classes and some avenues for both parents and possibly teens that are struggling with this. That's something for the future. Next week, uh, we're talking about homosexuality. Um, and then the week after that is abortion. So two of my subjects I know, but uh, let's say a prayer together and we'll be discussed. Father in heaven, we do thank you for giving us your son on the cross. We thank you for giving us this avenue where we can study from your word, where we can talk about sin. We know sin is so prevalent. We know that pornography is just out there for everybody to look at and see. And we hope that you know that for the majority of us we are trying to fight this battle we are trying to live in accordance to your will uh, maybe we do need to talk about it more than we do but help us to lean on each other help us to lean on each other as a church help us to find people that might be able to help us if we are struggling we do thank you again for your son just and we pray amen thank you for the way you broke that down the way you did the three